All right, here's a warm up question. Uh, this is, it's not gonna have too much to do with what we do in this video, but it's just extra practice with um, optimization problems. So we've seen examples before where we, um, where we're given that the perimeter of the yard is something and then we wanna maximize the area. Here is the reverse. Um, here we know that the area is 300. So here the area is the constraint and we're trying to minimize the perimeter um, or minimizing the amount of fencing that we have to use. So determine an expression for the perimeter in terms of only one variable that could be used to, um, to answer this question. So pause the video and then try that. I am just gonna assume that you've paused and tried it and go right ahead. So our side lengths are X and Y. So our area is just gonna be equal to 300. Um, and our area is just in this case given just by X times Y, so it's length times width. And our perimeter P is given by the sum of all our side lengths, which would be 2x plus 2y. And this is involving two variables, so now we have to use our constraint to solve for one of the variables. So you could solve for x if you want, or solve for y, it doesn't matter which one you do. If you solve for x, then uh, plug that in to your perimeter. So perimeter would be two times 300 over y plus 2y. Um, you could even write that as like P of Y to, to like kind of just indicate like, oh, now this is a function of a single variable Y. doesn't really matter, but this is 600Y to the negative one plus 2Y. And this would be the answer to um, what is being asked in this question. If you wanted to go a step further and actually, you know, finish out the problem and find the minimum value and then show that it's a minimum, you can now just take the derivative P prime is equal to negative 600 Y to the negative two plus two. And then you set that equal to zero and then solve for Y um, to get your critical point uh, and then show whether that critical point is a minimum or a maximum and then just go from there. All right, so we are doing antiderivatives um, in this video. And so here's the idea of antiderivatives. Let's, uh, let's suppose that a V equals distance in meters from a starting point at time T is given by S of T equals one over six T to the third. So it's velocity we then know is just given by the derivative, right? So this is our position. Velocity is the derivative of our position function. Um, and in this case, Derivative of one over six t to the third is one half t to the second, right? The, you'd get like three over six, which gives you a half. So antiderivatives um, is asking about the reverse question. So here we started with the knowledge of the position function and asked what the velocity was. What if we started with the knowledge of the, um, of the velocity function and asked what the original position function would be. Okay, so um, quick example. So if we know that the velocity function is 2t, given in meters per second, can we find the vehicle's position function? So the position function is gonna be s of t, so s prime of t is the derivative, that's equal to 2t. So we know the derivative is 2t. So is there a function s of t whose derivative is equal to 2t. So yes, t squared would be one such, one such function. So the derivative of t squared is 2t, so this would presumably be our position function. Okay, this is a little misleading because um, like there, this is not the only function whose derivative is equal to 2t. Another function whose derivative is 2t would be t squared plus one. Because if you take the derivative of t squared plus one, this part would give you the 2t, and then this part would just give you a zero. So if you just had t squared plus one, um, or even like t squared plus five, or plus um, 50, or uh, minus 50, or whatever, like t squared just like plus any constant, then um, that is going to be an antiderivative 
of 2t. So we would actually call the general antiderivative of 2t, we would just call that general antiderivative t squared plus c. So this is like the general antiderivative of this guy. Okay, um, so we can use our knowledge of uh, antiderivatives, like, or, our, sorry, we can use our knowledge of derivatives um, so far to discuss um, new antiderivatives. Um, so antiderivatives, knowledge of antiderivatives is really just like rephrasing the knowledge of derivatives that we already really have. Um, so like, for example, the derivative of sine is cosine. So an antiderivative of cosine is sine. So that's, that's kind of all I mean by that. All right. So let's find a general antiderivative of X squared. Um, so an antiderivative of X squared, you might guess would be like X cubed, but like, all right. So the way that like you kind of often do these things is sort of guess and check. So the derivative of X cubed is three X squared. And if you were to do your guess and check thing and you almost get what you're looking for, except it's off by like you're multiplying by a constant, then you can take your guess and then fix it by just dividing by this constant or multiplying by the reciprocal. So multiply by one third. Um, so if you just multiply by the reciprocal of this thing, um, then one third x to the third Take that derivative and you're going to get one third times the derivative of x cubed, which is 3x squared. And so these threes will cancel and you're just left with x squared. Um, and so general antiderivative of x squared would just be um, one third x to the three plus c. Um, Oh, okay, cool. Sorry. Uh, I think I like skipped a lot of slides somehow. I don't know what happened. All right. So what about like f of x equals like x cubed or x to the fourth? Um, what would it be for those ones for? All right. So for, so for x cubed, so your guess might be x to the fourth, but if you were to do the derivative of x to the fourth, you would get four x cubed. So four times that thing. So just divide your guess by four, multiply by a fourth to cancel out that four, and then you'll end up getting x to the third. So our general antiderivative for x cubed would be one fourth x to the four, and then what it would be for x to the fourth. So you might start seeing a pattern emerging. So if you do x to the fifth as your original guess, then you'll end up getting like an extra five in there. So I'll just do one over five x to the fifth. Um, oh, sorry, I should be putting the plus c's because these are general antiderivatives. So I need a plus c over here as well. Um, but yeah, so if you do start with x to the fourth and then you know just increase your power by one and then just multiply by that reciprocal, then that's gonna work. And so in general, um, the antiderivative for x to the n would just be, well, you need, you need to raise the power by one. And then if you were to do the derivative of just x to the n plus one, it would give you n plus one times x to the n. Oops, sorry, uh, it should give you n, n plus one times x to the n. But again, you don't want to have this n plus one here, so you want to divide by n plus one uh, to get rid of that. So one over n plus one times x to the n plus one, and then put a plus c right here. All right, this formula does not work for n equals negative one, because then this right here would be one over zero. Um, and so if you're doing n equals negative one, that would be, f of x equals um, x to the negative one or one over x. So you have to handle this differently. Um, so what is an antiderivative of one over x? So what is a function whose derivative is equal to one over x? Um, well, that would, all right, so what I'm writing is technically incorrect. Um, 
so the derivative of natural log of all right so what i'm writing about what i'm about to write right now is true but it's misleading um so the derivative of natural log of x is equal to one over x and so you would say from there oh my antiderivative should just be natural log of x okay uh it turns out that this is uh, almost right um, but not completely right uh, turns out the act the correct thing to write would be absolute value of x um, I think I'm going to table this and maybe come back to that uh, just for the sake of discussion so yeah we, we will come back to this um, but basically the antiderivative of 1 over x is not na not just natural log of x but natural log of absolute value of, of x and the um yeah I'll, I'll explain more later but for now if you're wondering like why does the absolute value have to be there well if you're just to do natural log of x you're not allowed to plug negative values into this you're only allowed to plug positive values into this but um, 1 over x, you're allowed to plug in both positive and negative values into this. And so your antiderivative ideally would be something that you're allowed to plug positive and negative values into it, such that you're still going to get the right derivative. Um, and it turns out that the derivative of natural log of absolute value of x just ends up being the right thing to put there. All right, I'll, I'll come back to this. Um, yeah, for now, let's focus more on this thing. So antiderivative of x to the n is 1 over n plus 1, x to the n plus 1. Um, so this ends up being uh, valid for any n besides a negative 1. So n could be like, um, it doesn't just have to be a whole number, like 3, 4, or 5. It could also be like fractions or negative 2 or like negative 5 or negative 2.7 or pi or whatever as long as it's not negative one. So this is useful for like square roots. Um, so if you wanted to do, uh, yeah, so if you wanted to do f of x equals um, just square root of x, this is like x to the one half. So your antiderivative would be x to the, so increase the power by one and then multiply by the reciprocal or which would be two thirds, okay? And so now if you take the derivative of this, you would bring down the three halves and then the three halves would cancel the two thirds and then this power would go down by one to one half. Same thing would work if you were to do um, f of x equals uh, one over x squared, which is x to the negative two. So here you could again increase the power by one and then divide by that new exponent. Um, so this is the same as like negative one over x. So, you know, if the power is negative one, then you can't do this thing. But if, if the power is negative two, then it does work. All right, what about something like five times the square root of x? So you, you would handle this very differently, or, or sorry, <laughs> very similarly, um, not, not that much differently at all. Um, so, all right, when you're taking the derivative Let's say that we're taking the derivative of 5 times the square root of x. Um, if you're taking the derivative of 5 square root of x, you could just kind of ignore the 5 and then just do the derivative of the square root of x and then just bring the 5 along. So like the same thing should be true for antiderivatives too. So if the 5 just comes along for the ride when you're doing derivatives, then it's, then it's going to come along for the ride when you're doing antiderivatives as well. So, so just take an ant, get an antiderivative of square root of x. Um, which again would be increase the power by one and then divide by the exponent, which is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal and then just bring the five along. Uh, and then, cause this is a general antiderivative, we need the plus C there. Have I been forgetting the plus C? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. P plus C, plus C. Okay, don't forget the plus C, it's important. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this is like 10 thirds x to the 3 halves plus c. Um, yeah, do I have? Uh, okay, yeah, no, that's it. That's it for that slide. So yeah, upshot of this is like if you just like 
one of the, if you know how to take the derivative of this thing, then if you have it like attached to a constant, then just t take the antiderivative of that and then just bring the constant along. All right, what about like e to the x? So e to the x is easy because um, it's just like, like, all right, do you know a function off the top of your head whose derivative is equal to e to the x? e to the x. So the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So there's like no like guess and check to like really do, there's no like fixing or anything. Like this is just your antiderivative. So the antiderivative is just e to the x plus c. Uh, or the general antiderivative. Um, if you had like e to the 2x, it gets a little bit different because the derivative of e to the 2x is almost e to the x, e to the 2x. It would be 2 e to the 2x just by the chain rule. And so again, this 2 shows up here. So because of this 2, like you know, we're only off by a constant, so we just have to divide by that constant to get to the right answer. So, so if we divide this original guess by 2, then we will end up at just e to the 2x. And so our general antiderivative of e to the 2x would be 1 half e to the 2x plus c. Awesome. All right. Let's find the general antiderivative for cosine of x. I kind of hinted at this one earlier. Um, so is there a function whose derivative you know is equal to cosine of x? All right, well, hopefully you know that the answer would be sine of x because the derivative of sine is equal to cosine. Um, so your antiderivative would be just sine of x plus c. Uh, by the way, um, common sort of notation thing that you'll see would be uh, little f is used for the derivative and capital F is used for the antiderivative. So if you see little f is this thing and capital F is this thing, uh, often, not always, but like often we'll use that notation to just indicate that little f is the derivative of capital F, or in other words, capital F is the antiderivative of little f. Those are different statements that are saying the same thing. All right, what about secant tan? So a function whose derivative you know is equal to secant times tangent. So this one would be um, just secant of x plus c. So the derivative of secant is secant tan. And so secant is your antiderivative of secant tan. All right, here's the self-check question. So we just talked about the general antiderivative for cosine. So what about the general antiderivative for sine? Uh, do you think it should be cosecant, negative cosecant, cosine, negative cosine, or none of these? So pause the video, see if you could figure it out. And then we'll go over. All right, that's enough time to pause. I'm just gonna go over. So, um, all right, so one thing about like the multiple choice questions like this when you're doing antiderivatives is you can literally just go through and then, you know, if you know how to take derivatives, you can just take the derivative of this guy, take the derivative of that, take the derivative of that, take the derivative of that, and then see if any of those give you sine, uh, and then, you know, just kind of do it that way. Um, or you could just, you know, be a little more efficient and then just do the guess and check method. So. So the derivative of cosine of x is equal to negative sine. Uh, and so we're off by a negative one. And so to deal with that negative one, we just, instead of having co cosine, we have negative cosine. So the derivative of negative cosine would be positive sine because we'll have a double negative showing up in there. And so negative cosine of x plus c would be our general antiderivative because the derivative of that, again, is equal to sine of x. All right. Let's find a general antiderivative for e to the 2x plus x to the 6. So this is just going to be combining information that we've already kind of talked about. Um, and then there's this like weird plus that we have to deal with. Um, but the plus is pretty easy to deal with. Because, you know, going back to, like, thinking of these things in terms of derivatives, if I were to just take the derivative of this function, 
e to the 2x plus x to the 6. I could just do the derivative of this guy plus the derivative of this guy. And so you might think, like logically speaking, that if I were to uh, just reverse that and then just um, start down here and then take the antiderivative of this plus the antiderivative of that, then you know you can just kind of like separate like separate all the terms and take the antiderivatives of each thing that's separated by the plus just one at a time and so that's what we'll do we'll take the antiderivative of e to the 2x and add it to the antiderivative of x to the sixth so antiderivative of e to the 2x we've already done this is equal to one half e to the 2x and the antiderivative of x to the sixth bump the power up by one divide by the exponent to get the general antiderivative, you just throw on the plus c. Um, and yeah, so that's that's all there is to to that one. Just take the antiderivative of this, antiderivative of this, um, and plus c for, for the general one. All right, let's say that a particle's acceleration is given by a of t equals 3 over the square root of t. Let's find the velocity function and the position function if it is known that um, v of 4 equals 7 and s of 4 equals 20. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, I thought... Hold up. Hold up. I think a slide... Oh! Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, somehow I just, like, skipped over the slide. I was like, I feel like I'm skipping over something because that one... This just like kind of builds on this slide. Anyway, sorry, I don't know how I skipped that, but we're doing this example. All right, so a boat's velocity at any time t is given by v of t equals 2t cubed plus 1. Find its position function if we know that s of 0 equals 5. All right, so this is kind of similar to stuff we've already seen, um, except we have this additional s of 0 equals 5 information. Um, so we know the velocity. So the position function is going to be the antiderivative of the velocity function. So position function is going to be, well, we take the antiderivative of 2t to the third, which would be, all right, so the 2 will come along. And then if we were to do the derivative of t to the antiderivative of t to the third, we'd get t to the fourth divided by 4. I'll just put that 2 over there. So this is like 2 over 4 t to the fourth, or a half t to the fourth. And then what's the antiderivative of 1? What is a function whose derivative is equal to 1? Well, it would just be t. The derivative of t is just 1. Uh, but we also have to have the plus c there for the general antiderivative. So this accounts for like all of the possible antiderivatives of this velocity function. Um, this right here, this s of 0 equals 5, this is here to like give us enough information to specify what this value of c should be. Um, so if, um, if C is like allowed to be anything, then we basically don't know what the uh, position function is, right? Because there are infinitely many possibilities for our position function. So we can say this is like what the position function should look like, um, generally speaking, but we have to like be more specific. And to be more specific, we just set up an equation by plugging in zero. So we get a half times zero to the fourth plus zero plus c, and that should be equal to five. Uh, I guess to the fourth, whatever. So that all goes away, and we just get that c is equal to five. Um, by the way, of course, this problem would be like a little bit uh, slightly longer to deal with if this said like s of one equals five, because then you would have to like actually like bring all these terms to the right hand side and solve for c, but you know. Having the zero there just kind of makes things easier. Um, but yeah, now we know what c is. c is 5, and so this is um, what our position function actually has to be. It's exactly this. All right, so back now we're on the acceleration thing. So we know the acceleration function is this, 3 over square root of t. Uh, we want to find the velocity function and the position function. Uh, if we know that v of 4 is 7 and s of 4 is 20. So same sort of deal as over here, um, except this is going to be like a multi-step process. So we know the acceleration. 
we want to use the acceleration function to find the velocity function. And then once we find the velocity function, then we'll find the position function. So we're just doing antiderivatives one at a time because the derivative of position is velocity, derivative of velocity is acceleration. So antiderivative of acceleration is, ve is velocity and then so on. Um, so if a of t is three t, a three over square root of t, I could write that as three t to the negative one half. And now taking the antiderivative of that to get the velocity will be a little easier because I can now increase the power by one. So if I increase the power by one, I'll get t to the one half, positive one half. And then I just multiply by the reciprocal. What's the reciprocal of a half? Well, it's just two. And you can check this by taking the derivative of this, three times two times t to the one half. Uh, so, okay, so this is just gonna be six, right? I'm just gonna write six there. So t six t to the one half, derivative of that would be one half times six, which is three. And then the exponent would go down from one half to one half minus one, which is negative one half. So that's, that's correct. And then we need the plus c right here. And now we need to figure out what the plus c is. And how do we figure that out? Um, well, we use this v of four equals seven information. Um, so v of four equals seven, then that tells us that if I plug four into the left-hand side, then that should be equal to seven. So six times four to the one half, by the way, that just means square root of four uh, plus c, that's equal to seven. So six times two, so this is equal to two. So six times two is 12. So c has to be equal to seven minus 12, which is negative five. So v of t is equal to six t to the one half minus five. All right, um, now let's deal with s of t. s of t is the antiderivative of v of t. So increase the power by one and then multiply by the reciprocal. So six times uh, two thirds. And then what's the antiderivative of five? It will just be five t. So the derivative of five t is five. And then plus c. Uh, we could clean this up. This would be, all right, six over three is equal to two. Two times two is equal to four. And now s of four is equal to 20. So I get four times four to the three halves minus five times four plus c is equal to 20. Uh, so this is 20. Uh, what is four to the three halves? I'll put this over here. So this is the same as like square root of four raised to the third power. So this would be like two to the third, which is equal to eight. So we get four times eight minus 20 plus C equals 20. So this is 32 minus 20 uh, or 12. So we get 12 plus C is equal to 20. And so C would be equal to eight. So S of T is four t to the three halves minus five times t plus um, c, which is eight. Um, by the way, it goes without saying, the c down here is different from the c up here. You know, technically I could be a little bit better about like using different variables, but uh, we were like already done with the c at that point. So it's kind of okay to um, use the same variable here as over here because we kind of, don't have the C anymore when we are starting from this point and going on. All right, let's just uh, end it up with a couple of um, antiderivatives. Let's do these kind of quickly. So sine of three X plus 10, uh, what's our antiderivative here? All right, so can do guess and check with a uh, cosine. So I'll do like start with cosine of three X. But if I do the derivative of cosine of three X, um, that would give me negative three sine of three X. And so I need to um, divide by negative a third. So if I do that, that'll give me um, 
actually just sine of 3x. And then what do we do with the, the plus 10? Well, that would be like 10x. So the derivative of 10x is just 10. And so this would be our general antiderivative. So f of x, sorry, with the plus c, would be negative a third cosine of 3x plus 10x plus c. All right, um, what about this one right here? So this is e squared minus 16x plus 5, 7, x to the 7 over 4. Okay, this e squared right here, this is not e to the 2x intentionally. This is, this is literally just e squared. So e squared, um, even though it looks weird, this is just a constant. And so the antiderivative of a constant is always just a constant times x. Ooh, sorry. Constant times x. Um, so if, anytime that you do just like, you know, if you had a 5 there, then uh, antiderivative of 5 would just be 5 times x. Because the derivative of a constant times x, the x just goes away and you're left with the constant. So constant times x, the x goes away and you're just left with that constant. Okay. Um, minus 16x. So x would go to x squared and then you just divide by 2. Uh, and then 16 over 2 would be 8. So we get minus 8x squared. And 5x to the 7 fourths. All right, well, let's just do this one slowly. We'll bring the 5 along. x to the 7 fourths. 7 fourths plus 1 um, is, so if you're adding 1 to 7 fourths, you're really adding 4 over 4. So this would give you 11 over 4. And then you just divide by that, or multiply by that reciprocal. And then you would get this. So this would be, that, and then you just tack on the plus c to get your general antiderivative. All right, uh, one over x minus secant squared of six x. Uh, all right, I don't think I can avoid the, um, the ln of x thing anymore. Um, well, all right, let's deal with the secant squared first. Um, all right, so let's just put the answer on the screen just so we kind of know. Uh, so I already kind of told you before the antiderivative of 1 over x is natural log of absolute value of x. And I haven't fully like justified that yet, but that's just what it is. Um, okay, what about secant squared? Well, the derivative of tangent is secant squared. So first guess here would just be tangent of 6x. But the, um, all right, so the derivative of tangent of 6x um, is equal to secant squared of 6x uh, times the derivative of 6x, which is a 6. And so this annoying 6 is there, so we just have to divide by 6 to cancel that out. And then we'll do the plus c just to make it our general antiderivative. So capital F of x would be this. All right, I'm gonna get rid of that because I wanna justify the ln of x thing real quick. All right, so remember that um, absolute value of x is, it's either equal to x if um, x is like not negative, like if it's greater than or equal to zero, then it's just absolute value of x is just equal to itself. Absolute value of five is just equal to five. But if x is a negative number, then you flip the sign by just like introducing a double negative here. So if x is less than zero, then you just multiply by a negative just to make it a double negative and hence make it positive. So if I were to plug negative five in here, I would get negative times negative five or negative negative five, so positive five, okay? And so if I were to do the derivative of um, natural log of negative x, what do I get? So I get one over negative x, uh, and then times by the chain rule, times the derivative of uh, negative x, which is just negative one. So those negatives cancel, and we do get one over x. So the derivative of natural log of negative x is equal to one over x, and the derivative of natural log of just regular x is just equal to one over x. 
And so um, from here, so 1 over x looks like this, um, loosely. It's not the best sketch, but whatever. So 1 over x looks like this. And then natural log of absolute, or natural log of x looks like this. Um, loosely, again, it's not the best sketch, but, and then natural log of negative x. All right, I'm gonna need to make some space up here. All right, here's ln of x. Here is ln of negative x. It's literally just the same thing as ln of x, but you just like uh, flip it across the uh, the y-axis. So just take this thing and then just mirror it over here. You just get that. And so natural log of absolute value of x would just literally be take those two things and then just sort of glue them together. So it would be here's ln of x and here's ln of absolute value of x. Just pretend that I'm mirroring this thing properly. This would be ln of absolute value of x. So this part, the derivative of this part is equal to this part, derivative of this part is equal to this part. And so overall, this is defined everywhere except for zero. Um, and the derivative at each point is equal to one over x. So that's why ln of absolute value of x is the correct antiderivative. Um, that absolute value of x does need to be there. All right, cool, let's move on. Um, five over two x minus six e to the four x. Um, I would recommend that you uh, try this one at this point. Honestly, you probably should have been telling you to try more of these on your own, but oh well. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna do it. So, all right, so the five over two x, um, you should think of this as five over two times one over x. We won't have to do anything with this part. Um, but yeah, so our antiderivative is gonna be five over two times antiderivative of one over x, which is ln of absolute value of x. And then uh, antiderivative of e to the four x would be one over four e to the four x. Uh, but we have to have that six right there as well because six just comes along. And then you just throw on the plus C, and this would be your correct antiderivative for that. Uh, you could make this a three halves e to the four x. Um, I'm not gonna bother. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, so that's it. Um, so yeah, this stuff is really just a lot of like practice and trial and error and just kind of recognizing patterns and stuff like that. It's really just connecting a lot of dots in your head. Um, so it takes time, but uh, it'll come. And yeah, hope that helped. And uh, yeah, thanks again for uh, sticking with me and um, being patient with doing the asynchronous learning this week. Uh, no, it's not always the best, but you know, hopefully the fact that you don't have to get up at 8 a.m. is a good compromise. And I will see you all next Tuesday, uh, bright and early at 8 a.m.